Uh, uh, very good afternoon to you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming, despite the rainy weather. It's really good to welcome you back to our auditorium after, you know, the three years of COVID. Uh, well, for those uh, of you who are new to the Hip Foundation, we are a foundation in Singapore uh, started about 10 years ago uh, with the support of our sponsors and our, our board. Uh, we, our mission is to improve lives in Asia, especially in Southeast Asia through our healthcare and education projects. Uh, we also uh, organize talks and we publish uh, magazines and books to share knowledge uh, as well as to create awareness on important social issues. So we organize events like this. Uh, so, you know, this is the post-COVID new normal. So on top of uh, having our live audience in the auditorium, we try to limit the number because of social distancing. We learn from our COVID experience. We are also uh, doing live telecast on Zoom. So we have audience from around the region who are not in Singapore, also joining us online. So it's good to uh, be able to use technology and share more of this knowledge and create awareness also in the Southeast Asian region with uh, the members of our foundation. Uh, a bit of a house rule uh, before we begin, we will uh, have a Q&A session after our two speaker uh, presented. So uh, for those of you who have questions, please leave it to the Q&A session at the end. Uh, for audience who are online, there's a, there's a space on Zoom where you can type your questions. So please leave your questions there and we will, we will choose the most interesting question to ask our speaker on your behalf. Um, uh, please turn your phones to silent so that it will not disrupt the talk. Now, let me give you a bit of background why we organized this series of talk. Okay, I'm sure you have seen our promotion material online. Uh, the topic of this series of talk on aging is called the art, science, and good news of aging, right? So we believe uh, we are all living in an aging society. Our average age uh, of the population is getting older because of better health care, uh, better nutrition, and so on. So uh, we, we need to be better prepared. There are ways that we can age better. And we have a lot of uh, doctors and healthcare professionals in our community who have good knowledge to share. So we organized this series of talk to try to cover different aspects of aging. Uh, the series has got five sessions. We start with the, the mental aspect of aging. We will have the physical aspect next, next week. We also talk about how to be prepared uh, and you know, not just uh, the aging people themselves, but the, the family members and the children there are tools, even online tools, to help you prepare for better aging. Thank you. Uh, we also look at how TCM, right? Uh, being in an Asian society, we will look at traditional Chinese medicine, how it can help in aging. There are a lot of solutions that we can learn from uh, the professional in the TCM field. And in the end, uh, I believe uh, on the 7th of December, we will wrap up this uh, five-part series with uh, a more macro view and a more philosophical view uh, of how we should view aging and how we should uh, uh, treat aging as something that is natural uh, in our life. I, I'd like to introduce our moderator for the series next, uh, Dr. Melina Sapia. Uh, who is uh, also helped to organize the, the speakers and the, and the content of the talk. She has been really helpful to the foundation. Uh, Melina was, uh, was trained as a food scientist uh, in King's College, London. 
She also has an MBA degree from Exact Business School, the top business school in, in France. And she has a doctorate degree in education. She has worked in six countries in the last 30 years. She's both a, a nutritionist as well as an educator in healthcare. She is now uh, the Chief Wellbeing Officer of the National University Health System. She has been uh, helping to uh, keep our professional, uh, healthcare professional healthy and well, while our doctors and nurses take care of uh, our patients, especially during the COVID period. She also speaks uh, seven languages according to her LinkedIn profile. Uh, I, I think I need to add one language to the seven. She also speaks Cantonese, which I think is the most difficult language in the world. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite Melina to introduce our speaker. Thanks, CD, for the introduction. Um, what you probably don't know is there was a pretty short runway to get all this ready. And I think him and all his team and the colleagues have done a wonderful job at the Head Foundation. So, and we're very pleased that the um, comms went out and all of you are here with us and those of you, I think about 200 online today. So well done to everyone for that huge effort to get all this done in a short time. Okay, so Mindful Aging, our two wonderful guests here, um, uh, the gentleman that I, one that I work with, one that I've just come to know. So let me start. Um, CD remembered everything and it put a strain on his aging brain. I did it the easy way. I got the paper out and have not taxed my brain. Yeah. So age brings with it psychological changes, which impacts our memory, personality and behavior. So we have both Prof Kwa and Dr. Ang, who will talk about the changes to our brain and mind as we age and suggest how we can age with dignity and grace by maintaining cognitive health. Well, I'll start with Dr. Ang, um, that you know um, is, is a new friend and acquaintance. He's the chairman of Dementia Singapore and consultant psychiatrist at the Psychiatric and Behavioral Medicine Clinic. So he uh, practices in private practice. And um, I asked him earlier on, shall I go on? Because there's a whole paragraph. He said, no need, no need. So uh, very modest. Right at the bottom, it says he graduated his MBBS from the Royal Free, um, from the University of Singapore, and then went to do his training at the Royal Free in psychiatry. And I said, oh, I used to live across from the Royal Free in Hampstead, right, in Pond Street. So, and he said something very, very important. And I think um, Dr. Soin, who is in the audience and some of us ladies will find that um, very uh, appreciated. He said that it was the first hospital that allowed um, ladies who graduated with an MBBS to actually train um, because there were no they, they doctors. They trained ladies. Yes. Because when, at the early days when there were no women in medicine, Royal Free was started for women to practice medicine. So it was the first medical school for women. Yeah. yeah, I think that's very, very important, right? Look at how far we've come. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and after that, they also they got, took a lot of Asians, those that were not privileged in the Western white system, uh, they took in. So that diverse and inclusive society started then in the 1800s, yeah? Yeah. Then Prof Kwa, my colleague, um, is Tan Gyok Yin, Professor in Psychiatry and Neuroscience at Yong Lulin School of Medicine in US. He received his psychiatry training at both Oxford University and Harvard University. Yeah. Over the years, Prof Kwa has held multiple leadership titles, including Head of Department of Psychological Medicine at NUS, CEO and Medical Director of the Institute of Mental Health, um, IMH for short in Singapore, and the president of the Pacific Rim College of Psychiatrists. He was a member of the WHO research team for the Global Study of Dementia and has published 30 books on aging, addiction, and mental health. He's the editor-in-chief with Norman Sartorius of the new seven-book series, Mental Health and Illness Worldwide. 
His novel, Listening to Letter from America, is used in a course on anthropology in Harvard. He has been invited by the United Nations in New York to address the World Assembly on Depression, the Hidden Illness. Um, and uh, I've seen, I thought I'd say something quirky about him since he didn't, it's not quirky. It's actually quite uh, elogious. He sang on stage um, in uh, an undefeated mind. I went to watch him oh, okay. at yeah. the Esplanade, right? Not was so long ago. It, it was fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. I'm yeah. glad I passed the audition. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we have uh, prime performers here today. And again, all these things as we age, if we engage in activities that are meaningful, passionate, but I'm not the expert. So I'll give over the floor to Dr. Ang. Okay, thank you, Melina. The, the theme for today is mindful aging. Uh, I guess it's about growing old. And I always believe as we grow old, the best is still yet to be actions. <laughs> okay, uh, we're dividing this as the talk in two groups. Uh, I'm going to do the first 20 minutes, which is really to romp you through the process of aging. So I'm going to do the boring part about aging. And Dr. Kwa, or Professor Kwa, will give us all the good hopes, or the good news. Okay. Ha, ah, aging, what can I say? We're all living longer. Singapore today, the mean life expectancy is 83 plus years. This is the result of affluence, the result of better health care, better nutrition, you know, clean water, dot, dot, dot. But living longer, Really, at what price? Old age is only desirable if we can age well. That is suffering free. WHO tells us that we can expect to spend the last 10% of our lives suffering considerable disability and serious chronic illnesses several years prior to this. So therefore, as we grow old, you know, although we live longer, there's an expansion of morbidity. Prolonged, pleasant, pain-free living can only be accomplished if we have the right genes, longevity genes, or we have right lifestyle. And much advances of medical sciences in aging is really centered around this. Sensible diet, exercise, and the prevention and management of chronic diseases. Aging is the final stage in development that every healthy, accident-free person will experience, must experience. So it is a journey. Okay, we cannot, we cannot but you know, accept that this is the reality. And aging is that time that is characterized by weakness and decay. Let's face it, our body cells are not immortal. The, they undergo a constant process of change, of cell death and cell regeneration. Over a period of seven years, most of our cells die or are replaced by new cells or are lost. And after the age of 30, our body system will lose about 1% every year. So this is the reality. Uh, it's, nothing, it's, it's, it's not a depressing story, it's the reality, and we must accept that this is the reality. Over time, cell replacement becomes less efficient. So they are re replaced by inferior copies. The shortening of, shortening of the telomeres as we age will lead to senescence, apoptosis, and oncogenic transformations. Okay, and this will affect our lifespan. At the same time, at the cellular level, the, there's going to be a loss of efficiency of our mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of our body. So over time, our energy systems also reduces. Aging is not pretty. The skin and muscles lose elasticity. There's a decline in muscle mass and strength. The gastrointestinal system, they become less efficient in extracting nutrients. Our urinary system, 
less efficient in excreting toxins and other waste products, a cardiovascular system, heart disease, okay, it decreases in strength, hardening of arteries, and therefore the ability to pump blood around the system becomes a bit more compromised, it requires a bit more energy, and we know that the cardiac output of a 75-year-old person is about 70% of a 30-year-old. So cardiovascular illness together with normal aging senescence will have detrimental effects on our brain. Poor physical health affects our cognitive functions. I mean, clear, if you have a stroke, okay, there's an interruption of blood supply to the brain. Uh, it leads to cell death in that part of the brain. Urinary system, as we you know, have you know, renal, uh, renal failure, poor uh, urinary systems, there's a reduced in efficiency in expelling toxins. In some old people, you may have delirium. The GI system, if you cannot absorb you know, the nutrients well, especially B12, it can lead to also symptoms that appear like dementia. Sensory system, it also undergoes change over time. The sensory system is the means for our brain to contact the world and the people around us. As we age, the sensory systems will decline and this will also impinge on the workings of our mind. The vision, you can see there a whole list, press myopia, loss of visual acuity, diminished contrast sensitivity, change in color perception, diminished visual fields, loss of peripheral vision, visual hallucinations, cataracts, glaucoma, macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy. So all these things will affect you know, our ability to see as we age. Hearing. Okay. Uh, as we grow old, our presbyphusis, age-related hearing loss, uh, affects about 50% of people over the age of 65. And 10% in old age may also have tinnitus in the ears. Taste, our ability, the, the, sen, uh, the, the taste buds also change, the sensitivity also decline. Smell, this is one that relatively little change, but if there's a loss of smell, uh, then it is uh, linked to cognitive decline. Touch and pain, there's a change of receptors in the uh, uh, thinning of and wrinkling of our skin and the reduction in those receptor sites. So as we grow old, our ability to connect with the universe or with people reduces. And this is, again, reality. Our brain also changes as we age. Uh, there's a decrease in the volume. Uh, even in healthy, well-functioning people, it's estimated that the brain reduces by 10 to 15% uh, during dementia. And the biggest loss is actually usually in the temporal and frontal cortex, as well as in the putamen, the thalamus, and in the uh, accumbens nuclei. Generally, decrease in brain volume is correlated with a decline in our intellectual skills. But the change in this brain volume must also be the result of less demand being made on our neural processes. Because as we age, you know, as we reduce our function, it may also reduce, you know, our uh, the, uh, change the brain volume. So it's about not using. Okay, MRI studies show us that the pattern of functioning in the brain also changes. There's a uh, memory task is become become less lateralized, meaning that uh, is less multitask. In a younger brain, uh, we are more multitask, but in an older brain, it's less lateralized. Another potential cause is decreased blood flow, leading to loss of oxygen supply, and therefore cells die. Uh, so the neuronal functions become compromised. Older people may suffer mini strokes, where small, minute portions of the brain atrophy. And when that occurs dramatically, it may give rise to vascular dementia. Our blood brain, blood brain barrier, which operates efficiently, filters out possible toxins in the blood before reaching the brain. But in aging, it may decline, uh, exposing us to, again, potential damaging toxins. Intellect. 
it changes over our lifespan. General consensus by the age of 75, the waist score is about one standard deviation lower than the young adult mean. Uh, there's a decline, especially seen in fluid intelligence. That is the ability to solve novel problems, less so in crystallized intelligence, which is pre-existing knowledge. So the stereotypical view of aging is a time of de declining wit, but increasing wisdom. Crystallized uh, is intelligence is in fact uh, knowledge that has been gained through experience. And so we can reasonably argue that wisdom is a part and parcel of this. Okay. Physical health, physical exercise has benefits on the intellect. Uh, we always say healthy, healthy heart, healthy mind. But eventually, you know, as we age, it may lead to a point of catastrophic decline, a very rapid decline. Uh, and that is really where the terminal uh, drop model is. Uh, so within that la the last few months of life, there is a tremendous plummeting of these abilities. We often talk about this thing, use it or lose it. The belief that age-related declines are attributable to failure to use our skills. Practice, hence, greater experience can compensate. Practice not only preserves existing fun skills, it also may revive supposedly lost or declining ones. Uh, we see in dementia patients, sometimes when you put them through certain drills and practices, uh, certain functions seem to come back, not spectacularly, but it does come back. So indicating that if we stimulate, there may be some. Compensation can also be seen in broader whole lifespan terms under the SOC model, Selection Optimization Compensation. This theory argues that we develop in adulthood by selecting what to specialize in doing, then optimizing by practice and in later life, protecting against decay of skills through compensatory strategies. Okay. Cognitive reserve. Uh, it said that people with high IQ, uh, better education, there is a buffer. People with high intelligence can lose more brain cells before a decline of intellectual performance is noticeable. Uh, another explanation of this is actually the scaffolding theory of aging and cognition, where uh, we actually tap on the prefrontal cortex to uh, take over some of the functions. Aging, reaction time. We say that reaction time gets slower as we grow older. The older person's nervous system are slower, less efficient at conducting signals. But once the task is sufficiently rehearsed to be automatic, then the age difference is less important. Okay. Oops, oops, sorry. Language, again, uh, decline in sight and hearing will affect our linguistic skills. Uh, more generally, a decline in physical health will generally lessen our uh, access to the outside world. Uh, and there may be an appreciable alteration in our practice of reading. So if age reading declines uh, in word recognition, syntax processing, story recall, these things occur. Next, aging and personality. The personality, the individual characteristics and the way we behave account for our unique adjustments to our environment. Okay? In people with a high level of neuroticism, neuroticism, uh, it is disadvantageous in coping with chronic pain in data life. Neuroticism is also correlated with high blood pressure, more likely to have memory failures on high stress days, significantly related to depression in later life, significantly associated with general risk of death from cardiovascular illness, and it is inversely related to general health status in older people, so neuroticism. Extraversion, advantages is advantages in recovering from stroke, in maintaining a high level of morale, a feeling of well-being, uh, and generally people with extroversion more robust, 
more healthy. Openness. Openness is linked with greater creativity and imagination. A person with openness has more, is more content, has more contentment about aging. Uh, along with conscientiousness, openness is a significant predictor of our active coping behaviors. Uh, and negative, but it's negatively correlated with executive function. Because in openness, uh, we just accept whatever. So you know, there's little need to plan or control. And agreeableness, lower level agreeableness, along with higher extroversion, uh, increased likelihood of the older person using hospital emergency department for treatment. High level associated with more effective regulation of responses to saddening events. So how you know, we cope, our personalities may affect, you know, our aging, uh, uh, in the way we cope with aging. Erickson talked about the eighth stage of psychosocial development and the older adulthood is the stage of wisdom. Our value is wisdom, is the stage of ego integrity versus despair. Ego integration, it is the acceptance that earlier goals have been satisfied or resolved. If you can accept that, then you have ego integration. A person who feels that not everything has been achieved may have a sense of despair because with death approaching, it may be too late to make amends. The person, thus that person may come to fear death and he or she ends life feeling very anxious or depressed. Take the journey to aging is about you know, resolving this by the time we reach that. So we have a sense of integration that we have done what we've done and we are able and we, uh, to accept it. Uh, then there's healthy aging. In aging, there are some conflicts that we need to resolve. The first is ego differentiation versus work role preoccupation. Many of us establish our status and self-concept through work. But if, this, if work defines you and is all that is meaningful to you, uh, when that job disappears, when we retire, what becomes of you? Okay. Body transcendence versus body preoccupation. If the older person overemphasizes his bodily well-being in the extraction of enjoyment for life, then disappointment will inevitably result as our health declines in old age. Okay. Ego transcendence versus ego preoccupation. A person must come to terms that he will eventually die. By attempting to provide for those left after a person has died and continually striving to improve the surroundings and well-being of loved ones, an overweening concern for self and the self's fate can be overcome. So therefore, aging is really about us making peace you know, and letting go. It's really about us coming to terms with so that you know, we learn to accept. Uh, and so aging, the conflicts that we need to resolve is really about learning acceptance. Acceptance that you know, uh, uh, this is the process and then knowing how to uh, support others in the process. Okay, role of older person and fa in family and society. In late adult transitions, the older person must come to terms with the fact that they are no longer the prime movers in either work or family life. So it's really about learning to shed leadership and to take a back seat. Some people on approaching retirement seem to be particularly on age, indicating anxiety about this impending change. There are five groups of people identified. The constructive group, they come to terms very fast. They're free from worries. The dependent, uh, they're okay too, because I have reached the age, I'm dependent on you, you take care of me. Uh, they rely on others to take care and serve them. They seem to age, they accept that this is who I am, and they accept that the, the decay is okay, I'm supported. The defensive, these are the neurotics. The neurotics will carry on proving, you know, and therefore they cannot, you know, grow old. Uh, uh, they keep work, uh, trying to prove themselves, but the day they can't, then you know, uh, they may drop into a depression. Hostility. Uh, I'm like this because of others, blaming others. 
uh, and the last group, self-hatred. Uh, they resent, they turn inward, they look at their own self and keep focusing on their failures. Uh, and that defines them that uh, they're not able to come to terms with. Okay, so what is successful aging? Successful aging involves accepting our limitations, renouncing our responsibilities without suffering a feeling of loss. A slightly less successful strategy is to maintain a fear of the ravages of, of aging and then to keep as active as possible. But eventually, failure will come and we still have to come to terms with aging. The worst option is to have no strategy and to blame all on others or on wrong factors that have happened in our lives. Social circumstances, especially personality, social environment, are related to health. And health is linked to a feeling of well-being. I mean, governments around the world keep telling us that we must all pursue healthy lifestyle. Live longer without being a burden to our health services. But our question I ask is this, how can an older person be adopted to persuade a healthy lifestyle if they've not already done so? Because we rarely take up bad habits in later life. All those bad habits are taken up early. And so you want to talk about healthy aging, then it's really about, in fact, talking to the young and not about the old. Uh, I, I, uh, I used to have a very bad lifestyle. I used to eat, drink, and did whatever I can. And at the age of 40, I was 120 kilograms. And on my 40th birthday, I said, this is the beginning of the change. So I decided to uh, diet and run. I run 20 kilometers every day without fail. I lost the weight from 120 to 80 kilos. Uh, and I have never gone to see a doctor since the age of 40. <laughs> and uh, I know that, you know, I'm healthy. And maybe that's part of it. So that willingness, that, that determination to do the change is really what we need to do and what we need to sell at a very early age. Aging is preparation for death. In the disengagement theory, it's argued that as people get older, our contact with the world lessens. We lose our spouse, we lose our friends, there's retirement. So aging really is about coming to terms with loss. Many researchers indicate that older people want to keep active and life section is fine uh, to be greatest in those with an active involvement, yes. But as I said, one part is involvement. But, you know, uh, eventually uh, we still have to accept. And so we still need to, in fact, learn how to live with uh, growing old. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ang. Um, and living proof that you don't have to consult doctors or worry about your health until something is quite wrong if you keep up that lifestyle. Um, thank you for sharing. Prof Kwa, sure. over to mm. you. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Melina. I wish to thank Professor Robert Fo for this invitation to speak. The seminar here, I know Bob is now watching from the comfort of his home. Um, there are quite a number of uh, familiar faces. Good to see Dr. Soin, Dr. Ling Sing Ling, Jean Ka, and many others. So my talk on mindful aging, enjoying the time of your lives, of our lives, has three areas. Firstly, I want to introduce this idea of mental capital and its relevance uh, in aging. Uh, secondly, I'll talk about the good news of aging. We often hear the bad news of aging. That the old people have no economic value to the country. Old people drain the economy. Old people take up hospital beds. And so it's time for some good news. And thirdly, something on opportunities for us um, to be able to age well every day. Some, 15, some 17 years ago, I was invited to 
give a lecture at Cambridge University. Uh, they want to know about our research here in Singapore. It was the first study in Singapore and in Asia on the prevalence of dementia. It was part of the World Health Study. And at the end of the, uh, the conference, we were invited for dinner at Fitzwilliam College, which happened to be the college of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. And uh, sitting beside me was a professor of economics. And he was the quintessential English professor with a long beard you know, and, uh, and Gandhi uh, spectacles. And he told me, ah, you are from Singapore. Tell me what are the factors you account for the economic miracle of Singapore? And I paused and I told him that, um, firstly, I'm not an economist, I'm a psychiatrist. And from my perspective, the success of Singapore may not have anything to do with economic principles. It has to do with two factors in the human mind. And they are creativity and mental resilience. Think about it again. In 65, when this country was formed, you know, it requires a lot of new ideas. And you go through difficult times. And the bedrock of creativity and mental resilience is mental health. If any one of the early leaders had depression, schizophrenia, or bipolar, it's difficult to think of new ideas. So it's, it's, it's mental health. The idea of mental capital was first thought about by the economists that it is not just human resource, it's but mental capital, or we call it brain power. So as I Look at a crowd here today. The, the, the mental capital is quite phenomenal in this room. Many people come from different backgrounds, challenge. Um, and the mental capital is often discussed as cognitive and emotional resources that allows us to have creativity, resilience, and learning. And it's from the mental capital that we derive relationship and community life. And the last sentence on relationship and community life is the social capital. And these two are very important concepts for the success of any community or any state. And the, the success of a country depends on the sum total of the mental capital of the people. So someone talked about the mental wealth, the mental wealth of a country, of a nation. And it is, as one grows, and you can see, on the, I, I have to turn this side to, to see. So you, you come from this side. Um, yeah. So it, it grows up as we grow older, as we age, and uh, the mental capital grows from good parenting, education, social cognition, and cognitive reserves. But you see the last part of the graph, it dips down. You know? So the person who do the graph may not have got it right. You know? It's possible to, to even to plateau it out or even to raise it up a little bit more. Because when they measure um, uh, intelligence and cognitive reserve, they often measure what they call the, um, the uh, conversion intelligence. That means problem solving, right? Solve this problem. That is called uh, 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 conversion intelligence. But divergent intelligence has to do with creativity. You write you think, you compose, those has, it's nothing to do with, uh, with the conversion, it's, it's more divergent intelligence. So uh, last month, we had a lecture by uh, Professor Wang Gangu. Professor Wang Gangu is 93 years old. He just won the Singapore Literary Prize, age of 93. It's fantastic, isn't it? You could still write. You, know, you, know? you would have thought that if he were to follow this graph, Professor Wang will be going dipping down very fast, you know, but he's still telling me that he's writing another novel, another uh, of his story. You know. So that's the mental well, and there are many things we can do. So for all the people here, that there's some reserve that we have that you can stir up, and that's just the thrust of our research in the NUS Mind Science Center. I'll, I'll now move on to the second part, which is the good news of aging. The good news of aging is that Life expectancy has improved. Right. When Professor Wang Gangu told us in the lecture, he said that about 70 years ago, his father told him, son, I'm growing old. And his father was just 50 years old. But his father told him that 
time in China, 50 years, people die in 50 years. That was the life expectancy 70 years ago in Singapore. You know? yeah. But now we have grown from 50 to 82. It's a time for celebration. But people look at, at this number with so much lamentation, fear, you know. So many old people now. But I don't realize that because of good policy. So, so what do you want to, to do? Um, the good point is that if you compare with the first world countries, like North America, the United States or England, they are the first world country. America, life expectancy is 78 or 79. They are the number one in the world, but they are 78, they're lagging behind Singapore. UK is only about 80 or 81. Singapore is ahead of them. Yeah. We should be proud. In fact, our, our Australian friends told me, you people should be going to England and America to talk to them about aging. But now it's the other way around. You know, you're still coming down here to talk to us. You know, And Professor Robert Poe's good friend is the late Dean of Medicine, Professor Lenny Tan. He told me that, you know, I, I think maybe because we have low self-esteem because of the colonial mentality. But I tell them that the colonialists have left more than 50 years ago, but we still think that the people across that side are a bit better. You know? The second good news is that you can add years of healthy lives. It is possible, you know, uh, with uh, increased sciences, the policy we can improve. Some years ago, um, I think Dr. Ling remember the government decided to divide the hospitals in two halves. On the right side, the right is Sing Health. The left is the NHG, you know, National Healthcare Group. And we're all invited to, to uh, Sentosa uh, for a retreat. The thing of a mission statement, and I know some people came up with a mission statement and said, well, we want to be the positive the Boston of the East. I said, what for would be Boston of the East? And other groups say, oh, I want to be the Harvard of the East. That's nonsense, I said, why? We came to our group, we told them, add years of healthy lives to the people of Singapore. And they said, well, nothing inspiring. You know, what kind of statement is that? I think it's important. You know? Well, being a bit you know, psychiatrist, I'm a bit persuasive. And towards the end, they, they got tired of me talking to them. They said, look here, we come to Sentosa, we want to play golf, you know. And you keep on telling us about adding years. Okay, we agree with you, and we're going to pack our bag and go to the golf course. So we all went off. So we agreed, adding years as you like, the people of Singapore. Six months later, the president of Stanford came to Singapore. His wife is Virginia Casper, professor of psychiatry. I was asked to bring her around NUH to show them what we are doing. And he stopped at the mission statement. Like, this is wonderful. This is what we need in America. Adding years of healthy lives. The people of America. Why must we say we must be number one in the, all the time change? We will be top. You know? Just adding lives. You know? So it is possible. You know? And the third good news is there is a program in Singapore now. It's the first in Asia on dementia prevention called h well every day is for delaying or preventing dementia. Now, um, I want to mention something about the, uh, look at this, is a Japanese painting on the tsunami. Yeah. So um, if you talk about the graying of the population, do not talk about the tsunami of old people. It's a terrible term, you know. Uh, once uh, one of the ministers mentioned this in the international meeting, I was the chairman of the meeting, I told us this, the, the MOH official, please tell the minister, don't use the word tsunami. It's a destructive force, you know. We are old people, you are great older. You tell them they are destructive force. The following year, the same thing, the ministers talk, it's still the tsunami of the aging population, you know. But we all know that the, um, the graph that shows you the increasing the rising tide of dimension in the number of cases growing. And this, this uh, slide, I did a slide, and then Ministry of Health people borrowed it for a talk. Then I said, oh dear, why did they borrow it for? And uh, because in the, in, the, in the conference itself was the chap in the World Health, they told me, oh, you should never show this kind of slide to anyone. And I said, why? They just look at the slide, this tells you that there's nothing you can do. And especially when you're a minister, you tell them, you keep on going, the, the dementia rate will go on. In policies, the, the, the rate should either plateau or come down. You should not tell people it'll go on forever. <laughs> Other disaster. So anyway, I'll, I'll tell you something about quickly on the, the studies we've done. It was 1987, the World Health team was here and, um, and we, can, we had a, a study. And the first study was over at the May Wong Day Center. 
the first center for dementia in Singapore is the May Wong Day Center at Henderson, Henderson District. And he found in the Chinatown study of 612, the prevalence of dementia was only about 3% and depression much higher. And I want to emphasize to all of you, although we talk about dementia, the bigger issue that confronts the country, Singapore, America, England, is depression. And depression has a mortality, that's suicide. So there's something for us to think about. And depression is also a risk factor for, de for dementia. And this look at it, the, the rate is still low. Uh, um, so you can tell people that, well, since it's just about 6% for de uh, de uh, depression, that means 94% don't have de de uh, depression. And that means also about 97 don't have dementia. So the good news part of it. And then we repeat the study at Topayo with the Singapore Action Group of Elders. The president then was Dr. Lin Chan Yong. Oh, wonderful chap, you know. And a local study of the local elderly, the de depression and the dementia rate was almost double. You know? So it let us know that these two conditions in, in elderly is somewhere related to lifestyle. Okay, there are some cases of dementia, maybe a genetic predisposition, but lifestyles plays a role. You know, that these are the people here at, at Topayo, middle class people. You see that the uh, they are quiet. The Chinatown area is so crowded. The, 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 the rooms are small and dingy. They prefer to stay. Let me get back again to this. You can see that. Oh, right, you see. That, that part of Chinatown is, is called Tringano Street. You can't see it now. It's now been spruced up now. But at that time, it was very crowded. But people come to the void deck to mix and play mahjong. You know? But here in the, in the Topayo area, in the Topayo area, it's not moving. No. All right, all right. You see the, the, the middle class, uh, the diet is a bit different, uh, like exercise, more loneliness, the depression rate was much higher. Moving, huh? yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. This is an important slide. I hope you spend some time. This is the first study in the world published on the natural history of dementia. So done by the, our team, you find that um, uh, there are two phases, or three phases, mild, moderate, severe. And the mild phase is about six years, moderate about three years, severe about three years. It's very important, especially for doctors, so that we explain to the patient, the families, you know, the, the period of care. I mentioned this because in 1984, I was doing research uh, at Cambridge, and uh, the person down there was a man called Sir Martin Roll. And I asked Sir Martin, um, Sir Martin, if, if I diagnose someone with dementia, how long he's going to live? He told me five years. Now, I don't have time to explain why the difference in Singapore and in Cambridge. But at least in Singapore, we tell people about 12 years. Right? And look at that, that uh, the, the x-rays down there. Those are called the, uh, the positron emission tomography, a special kind of x-rays. And you see that on the one on your, on your left, which is normal person, a lot of red areas. The eight red areas represents glucose uptake, the part of the brain that works very, very actively. So you see the, um, the lower part is, uh, is the back of your brain. It is active because um, you're looking at me now. If I scan your brain using the PET scan now, the back of your brain should be active because as you're looking at me now, my image is at the back of your brain. The, the eye is only a lens for the light to pass through, and my image sits at the back of your brain, right? So you see the picture on the left is someone with dementia. There are more, more, the less of the red areas, but there are red areas, all right? There are red areas that means that some parts of the brain are still functioning all right. This is a very important idea because people thought that once you have dementia, there's nothing we can do the sense of helplessness and hopelessness. You know, they call it the therapeutic nihilism. There's nothing we can do. But there's something we can do because the part of the brain is still active. All right? I remember I used to sit in, the, uh, in the, uh, the World Health team that decides on the, the diagnosis of diseases, the, the international classification of diseases. And we'll sit down in the committee and decide what is the diagnosis for bipolar. These are the criteria, one, two, three, four, five. What's the diagnosis for dementia? One, two, three, four, five. 
20 years ago, the diagnosis of dementia was a global degeneration of brain function. And I told the chairman, it's impossible. It can't be global. You know? um, because the chairman, they often sit in the comfort of Geneva, you know, and they hardly see patients at all. So he agreed with many of us that it should, it should drop the word global. And it's just a deterioration of brain function. So this is very important because from there, there are many things that we can do in the clinics for people with dementia. Then uh, talk about quickly the rising cost. This was a study done on medical students, third, fourth year medical students. You found that those with mild dementia, you speak, the family spend about $280 per, per month. Uh, but someone with moderate dementia, the figures go to over a thousand. And then uh, severe dementia, it comes down a little bit more. The rise for the moderate dementia because the families cannot cope and they often have to employ domestic helpers. Sometimes there's even two or even three. I look after a doctor. The family needs three to look after the person. All right, so, it, so in 2016, another group of medical students came to the department and we found that with the change of about 12 years, the cost gone higher and higher. Okay. Um, when I was over at IMH as the CEO, um, Professor Tan Chua Chuan said, you should do some research with IMH. I said, why? Said, because you changed the name from Woodbridge to IMH. Institute means behind research. I said, okay, we'll do a research. Because <laughs> <Right? laughs> I said, <laughs> so, so we agreed to do the research, the National Mental Health Survey of, of elderly people. And uh, we found that in this study, very interestingly, people who, who eat, eat curry have less mental deterioration. All right. This was published in the American Journal, uh, uh, and it was uh, cited, it was mentioned in the uh, New York Times, curry is good for the brain, a single study. Uh, another study we did was also on, on, on drinking uh, tea, and it came out very well in the British Journal, and you were interviewed by the BBC, and it asked whether, what kind of tea? I said, well, it's all kind of tea, but a, a different study done in Belgium found that poor is a better kind of tea to prevent cognitive decline. But then um, I was telling everybody that um, all this research is of relevance if it impacts people's life. And, um, and we thought maybe we should do some interventional program. It's no use keep on telling people the prevalence of dementia is 10%, the prevalence of, of depression is 50%. So what with all these figures? All right. I, I used to be the editor-in-chief of the big Asian Pacific Journal. We do at the end, we were a bit tired of people sending us papers on the prevalence, you know. We say, we want intervention. Yeah. So we've done an interesting study on, on, on intervention. And this study was, in fact, the, the, the brainchild of Professor Go Ligan. Some of you know him. He, he is a professor of family medicine. And I tell my, my colleagues that we should often listen to the family doctor or the the primary care doctor. They are that face of the coal mine. They are the canaries that tell us what's happening. Because we often sit in the ivory tower or in universities and the clinics, you know, we don't see what's happening at the ground. And they told me, do you know, I see in the, in the polyclinics, increasing number of people with very mild uh, memory problem. Can we do something to, to, to that, you know? And he came to see me together with Dr. Ling Sing Ling and with Gilbert Chin. Said, can we do something? And I got the idea because I was invited to give a lecture in, in Harvard, and I told the people in Harvard, we are thinking of a new idea. It's, it's difficult, you know, do a prevention, preventive program because you have to go to the community, all right? And, to, and it's impossible to do it in NUH because when you ask anyone to come to the clinic, you must, the, hospital, the, the clinic will charge them $200 as you enter the clinic, impossible, you know? So we're very glad that um, we have somebody in the community uh, who owns a, a huge uh, uh, shopping mall called the Jurong Point Shopping Mall, the, the Lee Kim Ta family. And uh, the, the, the boss, a friend of mine, he told me, we heard that you people are trying to do something interesting. We like to support you. And he renovated forever the space at the shopping mall for almost $300,000, the renovation. And he paid for the rental for the next 10 years. The rental is $7,000 a month. It paid for 10 years for the study. 
wonderful person. It is the first time in Singapore or Asia that the research team is anchored in a shopping mall. Research team often, you know, universities, hospitals, claim, but now the shopping mall, it also lift up the morale of, of the team. Instead of being hospital and boring food, now you have the shopping mall, wonderful food around. You know, lunch break, you can even go shopping and all that. You know. And what we did was around the, sh the shopping mall, we, uh, have, we, we do a very uh, swift through about 50 blocks of flat and um, brought the old people down those of 50, 60 years and above for a very thorough assessment by a nurse, psychologist, and two psychiatrists. And there a big team, about 20 people there. And what we did, we knew from our, our lot of information from the memory clinic that dementia is associated with hypertension and diabetes. And so we have Professor Go to talk to them about maintaining hypertension, diabetes, diet, exercise. And, and this is what we did. Besides the health talks, we divide them into four groups, a group of Tai Chi, a group of mindfulness med, uh, practice, a group of music, and a third for art therapy. And these are people who are who have very mild memory problem. They don't have dementia, they have the pre-dementia phase. We call it mild cognitive impairment. And they also have mild symptoms of, of depression. They don't have a full-blown major depression, but they have uh, symptoms also of anxiety. So if we did a study and follow them up for the next uh, five years, 10 years. In fact, by the second year, the editor of Lancet Psychiatry heard about this study and told us we should publish the data quickly because it's good news. What's the use of waiting for five more years? And so it was, a, it was published in, in, in uh, the Lancet. And this is what we found that you see the, the blue bars, uh, people with music, the red Tai Chi, the green mindfulness, and the purple art. You find that the people who improve in terms of their mood, anxiety, depression improve within a month, people with the music therapy. And but after, after six months, almost all of them improve. These are non-drug approach. You know. No drug was given, improve their mood. But then working in the university is wonderful. You have people like Dr. Malina who always ask us difficult questions. You know. Why do you do this? Why do you do that? You know, but it's wonderful because one of them told us that, hey, this study is good, but it is called um, a naturalistic study. We let them choose. If you want to do Tai Chi, you do Tai Chi. If you want to do art, you do art. The researchers told me, you know, that's... There cannot be in, in any research. In the research, it must be a randomized control study, you know, which I thought is a good idea. But if you don't like to play golf, you don't play golf in real life. But here, you, you, you ask, in the computer says, you go and play golf on the study, you must play golf. But so I tell people, it's, it's very easy to do a randomized control study when it's a drug trial, a green tablet or red tablet. But we are doing psychosocial intervention about music. It's so difficult, you know. That's why the, the, the study was over. The, the editor of Nature came down to see us. He heard about the study. He said, this is a wonderful uh, non-drug approach. So one of the person told me that, hey, mindfulness, uh, Tan Chuan Chuan, I hope he's listening now. He said, hey, you, know, you ask this medic, you want to introduce mindfulness in the medical school? Well, where's the evidence? You know, people, people might complain against you. you know? so, okay, then we do a randomized control study. So we had a... Uh, some of you know uh, the late uh, Mr. Wisinto, the best person, best person in the country to teach you mindfulness. 20 years of experience, you know. And, um, and the control group is supposed to be those who do health education. So we had Professor Goligan, who had for past five years, the, the top student, the top teacher in, in the faculty of medicine. Yeah. So we're head to head, the two, one of the best teacher in, in uh, uh, mindfulness, some one of the best teachers. So, and they have two groups of, of randomized control study. And what we did was we scanned the brain of the people doing mindfulness before and after three months. And you see the change in the, 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 the configuration of the, the brain. The, the red one is for people with health education and the blue one below are those with mindfulness uh, uh, practice. We don't want to use the term mindfulness meditation. People say, oh, is that religion? Oh, so mindfulness practice, there's great changes. There are more changes seen in mindfulness than in, um, than in health education. This is the first study published in the world on mindfulness in elderly people. And it was very well cited in the American Journal. And then besides that, we also um, took the blood to assess the telomeres. 
the telomeres, you see the, the blue areas are the chromosomes, you know, where all our genes are stacked together. The red ones are the tails are called telomeres. As we grow older, the telomeres become shorter and shorter and shorter. And just before you die, it ends up and the whole chromosome will unravel, the gene spills the cell and then we die. But this study you see the, the, on the, uh, the graph, the other side, that the telomeres became longer and longer instead of shorter you know, after, three, after three months. Then later on, it went down again. You know. Why? In the first three months, we told the, the elderly people, you must do mindfulness every week. And then after three months, we said, try every month. So it, mindfulness, in fact, was done every day. You know, you know, uh, um, I think, Melina, you do mindfulness, isn't it? Every day, they do it every day. Don't do it once a week, it kind of thing. Also, we took the, the blood to, to, to test the, the genes. We called it a, 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 a dendrogram, a, a, a gene expression. I must, I must say that this idea was brought up to a friend in, in, in Harvard. He did a study on stress management and measure the, the, the gene expression. It means that the lowering of the adrenaline, the gene express adrenaline, and increase of serotonin. So, but this study didn't come out well because the sample size was too small. You know? And they told me the gene study, you require 1,000 blood samples. You only, only give them about 100. In. And then we did something also uh, um, on the stool of the people, you know, uh, did the mindfulness meditation, uh, mind practice before and after, to check on the microbiome, the bacteria. And there's improvement in the good bacteria. This study is done with the microbiologists, Professor Lee, and the, uh, the PhD student was someone from Myanmar, Klein. And they have this paper, once again, the first paper published in the world on mindfulness and how it changed the gut bacteria, right? Because the gut bacteria influence the emotion, you know, some come, it also causes secretion of serotonin in the brain. And we, for, for art therapy, if someone said, well, we must also do something on art therapy. Can you, do, can you uh, do research? Once again, it's a randomized control study. And this idea was in fact borrowed from our, our um, Ambassador at large, Professor Tommy Cole, uh, who read in the New York Times that there was a study in New York on uh, dementia prevention using arts. You know? And I happened to be in New York, and uh, a friend of mine who knew the, the CEO of, of the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA, told me that there's a study going on. Would you like to visit MoMA? I went over there, and I went to visit their, their, their research team. And we found that they were using, uh, they were using the, the great paintings of Picasso and, um, and um, Vincent van Gogh for the old people to admire, then they, they assess them again. So I told Professor Tomiko, what we'll do, it must be something more elegant than that. You know? We're gonna scan the brain before and after, which they haven't done in America. But also we're not gonna use Picasso's painting. Right? Probably we use painting that the seniors, old people are more familiar with. The painting of, of Singapore River, then you can reminisce. And so you see the painting on the top is the, I'm sure anyone sees this painting will know that. This is Singapore, 1960s, and the painting is called Upper Nama Awa. And I'm sure Dr. Melina knows it. She's with seven languages. Yes, she doesn't know Teochew, my language, my dialect. Yeah. So anyway, so that people will tell you, oh, that must be the time when Singapore was part of Malaysia. You have to study the Malay language. In fact, I told some of my medical students, do you know that Singapore was part of Malaysia? Said, Prof, are you kidding me? <laughs> I told you, history is appalling. You know? So anyway, and we did a, a one rest, and this, I won't have time to go through it. We want to get a data from Professor Mahindran, who's a, the lead author. We also did a study on choral singing. You know, um, the lady on the, the right, uh, Professor Maureen Sarkov, um, and uh, she once again, she had the memory problems. And we said, can we do a study on choral singing? It's a randomized control study. Once again, the brain scanning is still a lot of interest. Uh, I have no time to, to run through with you on that. Um, but then we did a five-year follow-up study and it was published in our book and also in a journal, Aging with Dignity. You see that the depression rate is now about 4%. Before it was 7%. Anxiety about 1%, before almost 2%. The dementia is about 3% before it starts about 2%. But our researchers tell us, and bio, biostats tell us that if you follow a group of people after five years, the, the prevalence of dementia should have gone up to six or 8%. Age itself is a risk factor. But this study, it brings down to about just 3%. Another area of great interest, so 
So um, after we've done the study, our, our chairman, the late Mrs. Yo Chi Hien, said that this study should not be just in Jurong. It should be extended to other parts of the uh, island called translation research. And, and, I, and I agree with her. But I told her this should be the work of the Ministry of Health rather than all of us. And, well, we know that and some the people in the World Health told me that they have sent out a policy statement around the world. It often failed because it is perceived as a top-down approach. You know, do this, do that. Nobody will follow. So we are very glad we link up with people association. And now there are more than 12 centers and over 3,000 people uh, benefiting, impacting the lives of people. And there's also another thing of very quickly I'll run through something on gardening, which interests a lot of old people. And the study of gardening was in fact the, the uh, idea of the perm sack of, of national development. And he told me that this is an interesting study. We, she gave us a grant and the study grew. And then we started up what they call the therapy garden. There are now 10 centers and they're going to expand it to 30 centers uh, in, in uh, Singapore. And the interest of this study was mainly because uh, we took the blood of old people before they do gardening and after they finish the gardening to check for the uh, 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 biological markers, especially for the inter for the uh, for the inflammatory proteins. And we found that there is an improvement in the immune system, uh, suppression of interleukin-6. This is the first study in the world and it was published in Nature. And uh, we, once again, uh, we were interviewed by the BBC on this study. And there's also another study on the Tapi Wain Forest. Uh, after we finished the study, we were invited by NPARC's chairman, Mr. Benny Lim. He said, any new other ideas? Said, well, got new ideas. Said, so we're having nice curry at Dempsey Road. And he's, I told him this, how about doing a Tapi Wain Forest? Said, and uh, we invited a group of people to walk to the rainforest to measure the physical health, the mental health, the social health. Now, I don't have time to run through. Later on at the, uh, the foyer, there's some books uh, that talks about this study. and that, we have edited a book together with Mr. Abdullah Tamuji, our former Speaker of Parliament, who was also in that group that followed through the, uh, the rainforest. And this study was selected for presentation in the World Congress of Psychiatry because the chairman rang me one night and said, I look at all the abstract of Congress. Everyone talked about the prevalence of, de of, de of depression going up, the pandemic stress going up. There's no good news. The only good news from Singapore about the forest study that people walk to the rainforest, and there's improvement of physical health, mental health, and social health. Besides that, they also begin to love the rainforest. At the end of it, they donated about 6,000 or 10,000, more than that, Singly would know, to NPAX, part of the government uh, one million tree project. And so the, the chairman of the Congress in the, in, in, um, the World Congress said, this is interesting because by walking to the rainforest, people love the rainforest. And this is one way to prevent people from wanting to destroy the rainforest. But the chairman was somebody from Brazil. He said, do you know that in Brazil, the Amazon rainforest was 30,000 times the size of Singapore and people are burning it down. So if they repeat this study in other countries, it'd be wonderful. So the Malaysian friends are very interested, the Indonesian friends are interested because they also have rainforests in their country. All right, and I, I do this down because um, I, I love to go to the National Gallery and often bring my grandkids down there and they do some um, painting about the rainforest. Um, now, uh, 20 years ago, uh, during this, when the tsunami struck Aceh, I was invited by the Indonesian government to help out in the uh, psychosocial uh, rehab. And the Indonesian friends told me that, do you know, this, although the tsunami struck uh, Aceh, the mangroves from were not destroyed, neither were the rainforest because they are deep roots that held the ground together. So you look at the, the, the tree, trees down there, done by this, these two kids, you know, um, he's able to hold, and it's a, it's a metaphor of uh, cohesion, that, that if, if a society comes together, understand each other well, with deep roots of strong values, then the society will continue to prosper. You know, it's a metaphor. I, I know um, Dr. Molina is in a restive mood, I'm um, just one last one on the uh, future uh, opportunities. Um, and this was asked many times, what can we do? I was at a conference with uh, Minister Lim Boon Heng yes, on aging in place. He said, is there any studies? I said, no study, but we're thinking about study. All right. So people want to stay in where they live. They don't want to cut away to the old people's home and that's where you end. You know? If you want to live in a place where you stay, what can you do? You know? Firstly, you must make sure there's, 
there's a bonding within the family. So the study done on intergenerational bonding by three nurses and, and Professor Tang is an anthropologist on how to build up a, a relationship in the family. Uh, um, I look after a, a student in the NUS and I asked him, was depressed and I said, um, what my father do? He said, my father is an engineer. Where does he work? I don't know. Ask him, what about your mother? My mother is an accountant. Where does he work? I have this idea. So I said, um, we all eat together. No, we, we have grab food and I bring the food to my room and I eat the food. There's no conversation. Do you think they will, he will look after his parents? They grow old. You know, I have another colleague of mine, a, 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 a medical doctor, he invited me for coffee and I asked him what's happening. They said, well, I'm being beat down. You know? I, my wife has cancer. You know? I look after her. It's very hard work. You know? So I said, I, I thought you have two sons. No, one son is in California. The other, the other is in Melbourne. So it's, uh, what do you all do? The dinner time? Well, dinner time, we open up our laptop and then we talk to each other. So this is a digital family in Singapore now. You talk, you eat together, and talk to your friends, your family members. So can we build this up? Another one that is done by also by a nurse called Dr. Shifali, who won an award recently from the president, the best nurse of the, uh, in Singapore. And she did a study on where there is no psychiatrist. But when we do a study, the study tells us 10% of people with de depression. 10% multiplied by 50, 500,000 old people versus five means 50,000 cases. Can, can we cope? We can't cope, you know? All right, I, the last time I rang up any wage, waiting time is three months. What are you gonna do with that? So there will be some mild cases we can manage by people. So Dr. Shifali thought of new ideas, you know, and people say, well, why not we use CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy? You know how difficult it is to do CBT? Uh, so why not we do something that we are more familiar with? Uh, um, so we know that um, time is short here. Uh, um, when I was training in England, I only saw two patients in the morning. The first day I worked in Woodbridge, 30 patients, 33 patients in fact. What can we do now? It has to be brief. Something that you uh, integrate whatever you have, make some principles or CBT, including mindfulness. Why not? Mindfulness is a technique. You know? And then maybe something more personal for a person, all right? So a brief integrated personal therapy. So what we're doing now is changing behavior, changing values if we can. All right, I, I, meant, I showed this picture because when I told my, my agent An about my research, he told me, what you've done, you know, the ancient Chinese knew that a long time ago. They knew about longevity, prosperity, happiness. What's the big deal, all you people doing? You know? So I told him, Aunt, uh, we'll put a science to it, you know? Uh, mindfulness, we've got a science to it, art, music, there's a science to it. Yeah. But I tell all my researchers that study of, of aging is not just about genetics, MRI scanning, it's also about the humanities, about music, about art, philosophy, anthropology, literature in, 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 in aging. And uh, you remember this uh, Nobel Prize winner, uh, uh, Bob Dylan, forever young. Right? May God's blessing keep you always. May your wishes all come true. May you always do for others and let others do for you. May you build a ladder to the sky and climb on every rung. May you stay forever young. So Dylan was talking about the first part of it on spirituality. It's not just about genetic. You know. Second part, caring for people. Third part, the others care for you. And there's something else to do with that every, every day. Right? If uh, Mr. C.D. Liang has got an acoustic guitar, or can sing and play for you. Right? I want to thank many people who help us out on that. Um, and this book is called um, the Colors of Aging. It was reviewed in the British Journal. And the reviewers said this book should be read by Bill Gates because Bill Gates told the world five years ago before the pandemic, he'll give $100 million to whoever can find a drug for prevention of dementia. The professor said, you can never find a drug for, for dementia. You should read this book from Singapore. And I'm, I'm very glad it was good marketing for us. I know it's um, end of the year and uh, people are flying off for, for skiing in Korea. You know. I like to go back to my hometown in Batu Pahat, enjoy our coffee and our wonton mee, and often bring to me some books to read. And I, I avoid medicine, I avoid psychiatry, and I read some novels. If you have no books to read for this Christmas season, think of these two, two books, all right? Profiles of Resilience. Profile in Resilience is a, 
a book I, I wrote together or edited together with our speaker of Palian, Abdullah Tamuji, about true stories of Singaporeans who have gone through difficult times and have done well. You know, all right? And it's true. It's, uh, the people you see, we thought that they are now hot, um, hot shot uh, tycoons. Actually, in their youth, they are quite, some of the one of them live in abject poverty, but now they've gone up. You know? Another book that I will introduce to you is uh, Listening to Lack of America. It's the only novel in Singapore used in Harvard in a course of anthropology. Um, and uh, Dr. Sing, uh, Sing Ling's uh, distant relative, uh, um, Stella Korn, has read his book and he said, I must make a musical out of it. And so next year, there'll be a musical. And I hope you'll read it because once again, it's a true story of Singaporeans who survived the Second World War. And it's a delight. The stories, it's our stories. You know, you know, all the time you read about stories of the West, of the, of the wonderful heroes of the West. Hey, they're local heroes also. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Prof Kwa. Um, for my mental health and yours, perhaps you could give me a few lessons in Teochew. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have audience online as well as all of you good people in the room today. And this is where you get to ask questions. Um, yes. Uh, my English is not good. Can you pardon me? I wish to ask for neuroplasticity. Uh, what are the limits to neuroplasticity? Can we reverse dementia? And then as to genetics, uh, James Fallon, the neuroscientist in US, he's a psychopath, classic psychopath brain structure, but he did not kill anybody. But other people with the same psychopathic brain structure, at least 19 in the randomized study, killed people except him. And he was surprised because his family never alienated him. So he never killed anybody in his life. And I want to ask about mental health. Only IMH is interested in doing the study for mental health, but anywhere social science is not interested. So there's still a stigma in Singapore of mental health as a disability illness. We still do not consider them as normal. Although we try to talk to them and then cover them in dialogue, we still have a stigma. First, we kick him in the leg, then we console him. Can we stop kicking him? And treat them as normal. Like Carl Jung said, anxiety disorders are the result of conflict between the inner self and the outer pressure conformity. Because there's a conflict that's inside them, they are sincere. Outside people, especially in leaders' position, young pretenders, they don't want to be pretenders. There's a conflict outside that force them to conform to society, they refuse. And that's why it manifests as anxiety disorders. And how do we address this stigma? Thank you. The professor shall so, answer. So, <laughs> so now there's no apparently there is no stigma of mental health. The stigma is mental illness. And I, I mentioned once in a the big conference here in Singapore about the stigma of mental health. I said, no, it's not it's not right, isn't it? Do you agree? It's, it's mental health is mental health. Stigma is mental illness now, you know. Yeah? Uh, um, so the other, the other part about the the the, the uh, research, in, in fact, uh, NUS have done a lot of research. You know, uh, like dementia prevalent, they've done five studies already, um, and uh, of, of course, I, I mean, also have done uh, um, the, the studies. In fact, we, there's more in in, in NUS, uh, but we are very poor at marketing. We don't tell people what we do, and we publish in journals. We're very happy with that. You know, uh, that's why the book is came out on. Uh, the aging with dignity is in fact the idea of the late President S. R. Nathan. All right, he told me that all of you publish papers in a major American journal. We don't read all these journals. Can you put them in a simple book that we can read? So yes. Um, is it all right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, may I ask to uh, make uh, one comment and one short question? One is, what do you mean by mindful mindfulness practice? That's mm -hmm. it, there's so many you know yeah, variations right. of that. Mm -hmm. The second thing is all the things that help people, uh, you know, uh, in that depression and 
were, weren't they more to do with social connections? Because the Harvard study showed that that was the most important mm -hmm. factor. So whether you go for a coral singing or rainforest mm -hmm. walking and all the others, mm -hmm. it's all to do with social connections. Mm -hmm. So whatever you choose yeah. to do in that, that will mm -hmm. help your anxiety mm -hmm. and your healthy right. longevity. I always knew, Dr. So, you come up with such a brilliant question. You know, um, the first part on mindfulness practice is, is in the book itself. It, there are about uh, four pages to read. I hope you don't mind reading it. Um, or else you're going to take me another half and I'll explain. Um, so that we, we move away from the, from the term uh, mindfulness meditation because there's so much connotation. People protest against it. Some people say, we don't want to use the word mindfulness. It's, it sounds more Buddhism. So, okay, we call it contemplation. So, it goes on and on. But the term of mindfulness practice is used now because people are afraid of the term meditation. I try to talk to someone, can I teach you uh, mindfulness meditation? Oh, no, please don't. You know, don't. So mindfulness practice is more acceptable. The explanation is already in the book itself. It's about three pages. And then uh, the other question is on... Of I agree with you, right? Very good point. Because, for example, when, when Dr. Uh, Professor Maureen Sarkot did a study, I realized that for the choral singing, you know, what we did was we brought the people from, um, from the Jurong area to the Yong Siuto Conservatory of Music. You know. And beginning, they didn't know each other. You know. But towards the end, after the 10, after six months, they began to know each other well. At the end of the singing itself, they know the names. Before, they all stay in the same block in the near Jurong Point. They know Mr. Tan is somewhere in the second level. They don't know what to do. But now they know each other well. You know? and then, so the social connectivity is an important factor. But I will not say that connected by itself. You know? all right? uh, we know, in fact, in the study, we found that many people will not want to join the study in the, in the community. Uh, they prefer to sit at their at the, uh, the coffee shop and then mix with your friends, you know. But we realized that there are issues down there. And so towards the end, they went out, instead of you sitting down there, we'll give you a handphone. We, we give you messages every week. It's done by uh, one of our friends, Mr. Peter Lempoki. He said, I'll, I'll give each of them a handphone and every week. And this is done among the Malay population. The first time in the world using handphone to disseminate information to people. And every every week, every day, they were sending something. But this morning, the group sent each other a salamanko in the morning. Good morning, you know. So wonderful, they connect together. The social connectivity is set correctly. But there's only one component, but a very powerful component. Uh, for similarly, when we do the forest study, we walk through the rainforest, you know, and uh, we ask someone from the end parks to follow us because every time we walk through the forest or you drive to the street Singapore, you see some beautiful trees, you don't know the name of the trees. The chat will tell you what the name of the trees, what are the medicinal value of the trees. At the end of that, they begin to sit together and talk about their life story and they bring the family, the, the, the group together. And now, because of the pandemic, some of the people in the group are widows and widowers, and others begin to care for them. Oh, I'm going to the shop, to the uh, to the grocery, to the grocer, and which would buy something, so they care for each other. Very good point, social connectivity, because Loneliness, we know, is one of the risk factors of depression, and it's what you're frightened of, and so these people can come together. It'll be wonderful for the community. So the success of a community, talk about resilience, not yourself. You know, The success of the pandemic is not that, oh, I wear my mask, I'm okay, but also make sure your colleagues are okay, your neighbors are okay. You talk about the ecology of resilience. Like the people together come together to bring about the success. Sir. So uh, I speak from the perspective of spending half my time in Singapore and half my time in Johor, including Batu Pahat, Minya Beku. <laughs> from pedestrian observations, uh, the elderly in the countryside with open spaces, they are more resilient. They are more, they are more mindful especially towards the nature surrounding. Uh, unfortunately, in Singapore, we are experiencing an almost daily observation of pockets of rage incidents from the road users to those who use public transport. Could, could this be attributable to 
the limited personal space that the human species is living in Singapore. Can, can, can we perhaps get down to the very basic fundamentals? Uh, also, with due respect, uh, do we dare to be mature and talk more open, especially about the primal instincts of the aging male? Because from my experience as an AIC volunteer, as a member of the Silver Hair Club, and with uh, my engagements with people in their 70s, 80s, and even late 80s, the primal instinct overrides everything. And we have covered a very extensive spectrum of topics. However, one subject that appears to be embarrassingly or in inconveniently ignored is that of the sensual pleasures that the human species require to, 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 to age well, to live well, and to simply be primal. So, so, so would, would you or have, has the academia looked into this aspect of basic fundamental strokes that will result in the society self-healing. Because from my layman perspective, there is a proliferation of spas, heartland spas offering massages and so on and so forth. And if you look beyond the surface, a lot of the patrons of such establishments are actually senior citizens. Whether it is wise or not, that is another subject. But these are symptoms of mushrooming problems in our aging society. So I, I really appreciate if we could have a more open and mature discussion, especially about sex, Pornography, perhaps, can, can, can our society handle this evolution? Thank you. May I just jump in here? Half of our population is female, and I'd like very much for the question to be addressed to both men and women as aging progresses, because I don't think women are in any way less deserving of a subject on sexual health. I think it's good. For the women, there is a very big group of dance instructors from Eastern Europe. Well, not really me. If 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 you look around the night circuit in Singapore, there are there are certain establishments which cater to the primal needs of women also. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, perhaps, would you like to have? Yeah. Perhaps what you're talking about, you know, about uh, the need for closeness is intimacy is the key story that you are trying to uh, address. We are living in a society where, unfortunately, uh, our most of us actually end up losing the connect, losing the intimacy and closeness. Whether it's about you know uh, going to work. Uh, we've become a very competitive society driven to ac accomplish certain targets uh, and at what cost? Okay, so we're looking at what is the cost? I mean, family systems, you know, uh, there are breakdowns of family. People are not talking. People are not communicating. Systems are breaking down. Uh, so we are building well in one area called, you know, we're making money. But at what cost? At the end of the day, you know, it's cost and effect at what cost? And I, we do see that, in fact, family systems are subjected to quite a lot of tensions, whether it is husband-wife intimacy or even relationship between parents and children. Okay, so what you're describing is actually a question called what is happening to society? Uh, what is actually the tension that is occurring? Because uh, we want everything to be perfect. 
but there's no perfection. And you want this, something else has to give. Uh, and we are looking at society. So when you're talking of the proliferation of all these spas and various things, what does it tell us? It talks about loneliness. It's something is missing in my life. You know, I don't have closeness. And it's true, you're yeah, right. But why? Okay, uh, it's really to do with what is what is the fabric of society today, you know, that has been there's a tear, there's a shift. And I think these things need addressing. You need to recognize Obviously, it has to be organized. Uh, I think uh, can we just clarify some points? I think you mentioned something about um, aging in the city. I think um, in uh, in about uh, ten years time, apparently you know, you seventy percent of people will live in cities. You know, and uh, one man's ceiling will be another man's floor. You know, we're all congested together. You know? But unfortunately, although we live so close together, loneliness is a big issue. You know? Many people live together uh, in the same block. They don't know their neighbors, and uh, and sometimes you read in papers, elderly person found uh, dead or weak, and the neighbors know about it. There must be a different way to look and see, and see what we can do. The second point you talk about sexuality in late life. I, I think this is a very important topic. You know, basic instinct. You know, um, in fact, um, maybe uh, C. D. Liang would think about it because. Uh, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, the Singapore Action Group of Elders had a seminar I was down there. And they published a book on sexuality in late life. You know. mm -hmm. It's not about pornography all the time, you know. You know. Uh, uh, but so these are important points. I take your, your point on that. Hi. Thank you very much for the talk. It was very, very inspiring. So uh, I do a lot of work by distributing food with my club. I belong to the Rotary Club of Jurong Town. And I have observed that most of the people that we distribute food to live in some uh, environments that are not very conductive for healthy aging. The flats are very dark. They are usually in the middle, middle corridor, which are very ancient type of, of flats. What is government? the government of Singapore trying to do to improve the life condition of those people. Most of them live by themselves. Most of them lives with a not body able, so they are bound to wheelchairs whatsoever. So, and I think that most, many of them face mental health issues as well. So is there any policy that is ongoing or are discussions to help these people? Government policy. I'm not in a government. I'm not too sure whether who is in government. Uh, Doctor Swan, you know something? You're quite near the government, although your opposition side. Then, yeah. no. <laughs> I think the Befrienders Association is trying to reach out to many of these people who live alone. And they have even given them an iPad so that every day they can uh, signal back to this uh, head office to say, I'm okay, so that they know they are okay. Then we have other NGOs. This is, she represents Wayne. Yeah. I see that the government wants to rely on NGOs and friends. Yes. In Singapore, we, they believe in the many helping hand. Uh, you know, policy and the government will give the money, but it will usually not take a direct approach to help. So it all falls on the NGOs, and you're quite right. There is no coordination. They and but that needs to be done. So you know, you put your your on a very important point, mm -hmm. but the government will say, well, we can't do everything. So you know, people who but it is lacking and there are many people who are suffering because they are staying alone or with an unrelated person in a white flat. You're right. Can I make a correction? Uh, Dr. Soy is not opposition. He says a nominated no. member of parliament. <laughs> I don't mind Yes. 
Okay, to, to be fair to a, a larger audience online, uh, they also have questions. Let me ask one of the questions online, you know, so that they we, we also hear them. Uh, I believe this is a question from uh, some of our neighboring countries' uh, attendees. Uh, the question was, you know, uh, it looks like uh, there are many interesting programs uh, being at least experimented in Singapore uh, with some interesting outcome, uh, with good findings. Is, are there plans or channel for some of these good initiatives to be introduced, uh, to be shared in the neighboring countries with a much bigger population who, mm -hmm. who are also aging? Mm -hmm. Thank That's you very much, uh, C.D. Liang. Um, so the uh, Age Relief Everyday Program is, is now uh, been extended to ASEAN countries, uh, given talks in Indonesia, Malaysia, even China. And uh, there's also an online training program. So in fact, uh, one of the programs was on Surya, the Malay uh, channel, and uh, the people in Johor Bahru seen it, uh, and uh, they asked us to help them in the seminar. And even in Batu Pahat, you know, they wanted to have an age well every day in Batu Pahat. So it will be sometime in April. Uh, so it will be there. It will be wonderful that it will be there and be more people. Uh, be, be, um, so the, all these ideas are uh, from the people here. And, but we will glad to, to share with other people the, in the uh, ASEAN countries. Maybe I could ask my question. But before I ask my question, maybe I'll uh, put a little bit of context. I'm. Um, I'm a big follower of uh, a psychiatrist called Jordan Peterson. And uh, through Jordan Peterson, I'm quite aware of the five factors model. And uh, my training is actually in economics. So I, I, I take sociological issues and um, see how industries would be able to grow. Um, one of the things I realized is in Singapore, we, we have a um, uh, we are a very, very developed economy and we, we always look for something new or try to build new industries. And we always look for divergent thinking. And uh, one of the factors of uh, the five models is neuroticism. And uh, according to what I've understood from Dr. Peterson is that people who are a little bit more on the neurotic spectrum tend to be possessing higher intelligence but it also comes with its drawbacks. They are more depressive. Mm. And as we accept more talents into our little red dot, how are we going to manage in 20 years a whole bunch of very depressive but very intelligent people who are going to be, uh, who may be social liabilities? How do we transform them to be happy people? Because we're so dependent on pushing the curve, um, breaking new barriers, creating new industries, and being on top. Um, I was just kind of wondering uh, whether uh, the book, book professors have got any ideas, whether it's through meditation or kind of uh, methodology to turn divergent thinkers into conformist? Is that how we are going to uh, create our society? And how are we going to move forward? Yeah, thank you very much. I, personality is developed over time. It is set over time. Uh, and therefore, you know, you're asking a question, you know, what will happen when we bring them there? Is it what's going to be that we're going to end up? The reality is this. Are there not many neurotic people in Singapore? Not, there are not, you know, in fact, the Lawai that has come to Singapore. The truth is, we are a neurotic country. We grew a country using insecurity to drive society. Full stop, right? Uh, and you use insecurity, then we use competition, we use pressure. What kind of population do we have? Neurotic people, full stop. So therefore, don't ask the question called, when they come, are we bringing neuroticism here? We are already neurotic. Huh? Well, I 
Ah, then that's the next question. If you know that we are actually a society that is very neurotic, then my question is, how then do we begin to build a new frame? Uh, because if you use insecurity to drive, the only outcome is more and more tensions. Uh, we are very good at pushing people to say, you know, remember 1965 when we become independent. Uh, every national day is threats to the north, threats to the south, threats to the east, threats to the west. Every, every national day, if you don't do this, you're going to be finished. If you don't work harder, you'll be finished. If you don't do this, you'll be finished. If you don't produce more children, we'll be finished. If you don't have more ed university educated, mar 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 marrying university educated, we'll be finished. So the story is, we are all going to be finished. <laughs> right? Uh, that's society. If you want to actually have a, a more encompassing model, then it's not about you'll be finished. It's about encouragement. It's about support. It's really about bringing people together. Uh, why are we having so many unhappy people? Why are we going to massage parlors and doing all kinds of things? It's because at the core of it, we have actually not built a society that knows how to connect. We're not connecting. If we don't have connection, then what we have is separation. Then we have got people living in one room HDB that is not connected. And we build them in such a way that there's a dark corridor, one room to the left, one room to the right. We're not connecting people. People are connected in HDB estates. What do we do to those estates? We tear them down for regeneration. Let's go, let's go and make more money, sell it, do more. At the end of the day, the elderly folk, they have to move out of the flats, now have to go to somewhere else where there's no more community. So we're going to build community. We're creating neurosis. And that's the problem. It says it's about us taking a step back to think, what is society? What is family? How do we function? Okay, we don't build those, then we actually have, you know, uh, it's a field day to have more and more psychologists, psychiatrists, and what else, and social workers. Uh, and therefore, you know, some time ago, uh, 19, 1980, George Jose, uh, mental health is sunrise industry. Wow, they made that a sunrise industry. It, it's a statement, right? That the society is going to get broken. Think about it. I was a Professor Tang Leng Leng student when I was studying in NUS uh, in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, I would just ask a simple question. Uh, what's the latest research on uh, stem cells, uh, uh, you know, on uh, anti-aging? And as for the earlier comment about, you know, discrimination against uh, maybe psychotic personality, whatever. I was sitting in LT11 when Lee Kuan Yew came uh, uh, during the election campaigning. And he was saying that he suggested Go Chok Tong to go and see a psychiatrist over his uh, problems of freezing in front of a crowd. I don't think he did too badly for his career. Thank you. Well, stem cell um, was an idea that, that came about uh, almost 20 years ago. Um, but so far, I don't think anyone has done a study on stem cell with dementia. Now, in fact, I had a patient that came all the way from Japan with dementia and they asked me, are you all doing some, anything? Uh, I said, no. Um, the study with Parkinson's disease uh, um, is very iffy. Yeah. Um, so so that's, that's uh, an area we're not familiar with, I'll tell you that. Uh, um, I know some of our friends have gone to their stem cell therapy to, 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 to look for the fountain of youth in there. I, I don't think they'll find anything down there, but this is it's, it's an industry, you know? As someone said in the uh, in the um, UN now is the comorbidification of health. Health is now become a commodity for you to trade now to buy and to sell. So it's very dangerous thinking, you know. But it is done. You know, people think of health this way. It's an industry now, you know. All right. But we don't have any research done on that. You know? um, I don't know if I need the microphone, but I'm happy to speak very loud. Um, I'm going to try to make my question concise, but I can't help to have a, a small comment. Thank you both for amazing talks. I'm an academic by training, and I'm very appreciative of the challenges that you probably face when you have to identify a biomarker or a measurable proxy and randomized control trial that are definitely not readily applicable to your field. Uh, the comments is for the first speaker. I was particularly touched when you mentioned that personality and habits are built over a lifetime. And I, I, I'm very appreciative of coming from the West where we are our fair load of uh, neurotic people. 
and that in, in Singapore, the social fabric in this HDP, the bottom of it is quite dense and, and remarkable. And having two young kids that do not get to see their aunt and uh, uncles or grandpa every day, is, uh, meeting a lot of them uh, at the playground near the hawker center of an HDP is wonderful. Mm -hmm. So my comment, this guy has a question, is um, I would love to see more initiative, if any, of bridging, bridging uh, generation uh, gaps and having this um, awareness of aging as being an ineluctable and natural mm -hmm. process in life, yes. being introduced to kids. And, and I'm not aware of that. Uh, mm -hmm. And I would be very happy to, yes. to see more of this. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I didn't really have a question. Yeah. I think it's a good point. I think that to let people know that aging is a physiological process. So I'm, I'm always amazed when people tell me, oh, we're looking for a new drug, an anti-aging drug, you know? Mm -hmm. And that become a big industry now. People mm -hmm. in the market, is the new drug now. And um, it, they'll never be successful. But, but the way the marketing goes, you know, uh, that you know, people spend a lot of money. Uh, in fact, I've, I've read somewhere in the, that Congress is trying to look to all these things in America. You know, that's billions of dollars spent on all these anti-aging agents. You know, to stop you, the uh, the panacea of eternal youth kind of thing. Yes. Right. Good point. And I and I agree that there should be more link between. Uh, um, we, we find that somebody will look after their parents and care for them if they know that uh, they, they care for these people. In fact, the uh, a group of students from RI, the top student of top school apparently, came to see me and said, we're going to do a study on aging. You know? And I said, don't do something too high pollutant. Find out from your people in your class, how many are living with grandparents, how many are not looking after grandparents, and find out will they in future look after their own parents. And we found that those people who live with their grandparents are more positive You've seen their grandparents growing old, they love their parents. Whereas those people who don't live with their parents look at aging from on television, minister visiting old people's home. To them, aging means, oh, frailty, a burden to me. No, I don't want that kind of thing. So the, the, the positivity is there when they have mixed quite often. We have see the elderly grandparents growing older and the love, the compassion within the family. The, the, the good news is actually there are some childcare centers that are now co-located with uh, senior care centers. Mm -hmm. uh, they are just next door to each other. They bring, they cross-pollinate. The children come over for lunch and dinner. And this is actually perhaps part of, you know, what we need to do is to bring the link. Uh... I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the European initiative that involves mm -hmm. elderly library. Yes. And allow people to for a book or for the time for now. Well, we have all run by almost 20 minutes. Uh, let, let me just ask one last question on behalf of the, the online attendees before I, I let uh, Dr. Molina conclude the session. Uh, the question is uh, somewhat philosophical. Why do we need successful aging? Uh, why can't we just have normal, ordinary aging? Using the word successful, make lives very stressful. <laughs> Good point. Uh, I think aging is inevitable. Successful aging is about aging gracefully. So it's about you know, learning how to grow old and live well. So that success is not about you know, success in, in material terms, but it's about the ability to get ourselves to a point where we can feel good about ourselves. Uh, so in that sense, it is uh, uh, graceful. Uh, and we acknowledge that this is a journey and we accept it with uh, uh, courage. This, this idea of successful aging was in fact the idea of Jack Rowe or John Rowe, professor of geriatric medicine in, in Harvard. So he's been here a couple of times and I was over his place at Beth Israel, the hospital in, in, uh, in America. And, and I disagree with the term successful aging right from the beginning. I told him that people are unhappy in Singapore because to them, they say, wow, this success again. We have gone to difficult time exams. It means you, you don't reach that the five points, that means you fail again. They tell I'm growing old, I'm told I'm a failure. That is a bad term. So unfortunately, the Ministry of Health have latched onto that, input, uh, that, that term now. And I try to convince the Ministry of Health, the better term is age well every day. 
And I'm glad in the last uh, discussion with them in the in the in the in the lecture in the speech given by the minister, he used the term age well instead of successful aging. I think it's a wrong term. And in fact, Jack Rowe also is trying to drop the term now. That difficult. Once you publish in the World Journal, everyone wants to get onto it. Even the rating scale for that also. Come on, we've got to do ourselves. We've got a mind of our own. We can think on our own. You know? Well, um, first of all, I think you'd agree that was a very exciting dialogue that we had and interaction with the audience as well as the audience online. Dr. Ang, um, beyond the agility of your mind, you also have your 20K run every day. What he failed to inform you was he goes to bed by about 8 p.m. and is up by 4 and running for two hours. So there's a certain discipline to it if you want to age, I think, in that well, in that sense. And I asked him whether he had bionic knees and he hasn't told me yes or no. So <laughs> I think the answer is no. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Ang. And Prof. Kwa, a delight as always to hear you. You didn't sing for us today, not yet, but perhaps later. Uh, thank you for all the wisdom and also bring it closer to society, um, the social connections, whether it's people um, younger, middle-aged, and then the more frail ones, and therefore looking after one another. I believe the um, three-generational Harvard study that was done was by a doctor called Robert Waldinger. And if you um, look for him on YouTube, you'll find his TED talk. And it does say that the single greatest predictor for longevity and happiness is social connections, even if you smoke, even if you take drugs and everything else. So, you know, surround yourself with people, friends, family, um, and sometimes total strangers. You can connect with them at the bus stop for a few minutes and, you know, feel good about it. So try not to let this scourge of loneliness, you know, descend upon us. And it's not just the elderly. Any, every age, people are disconnected. Um, and we can't blame social media. We can't blame our devices. We need to take charge of it ourselves because these are just tools and devices. We're, we're the ones in charge, I think. So um, we'll try to all age mindfully, uh, paying attention as you know, our cells sort of uh, slowly give up on us, but we don't give up on ourselves. Thank you both for a very exciting talk today and thank our wonderful audience for all being here. Thank you very much.